Hello and welcome back to freephotoshop.com and what is the second part of this tutorial looking at the magnetic lasso tool. In the previous video we looked at the essential information you need to know to get to work with the tool. Now it's time to explore some of the more technical aspects of the tool so as to ensure we're getting the best performance from it at all times. I have open on screen an image called Red Balloon and our final goal in this project is to select this entire balloon with the magnetic lasso tool. Now to start things off I want you to come over here to the toolbox and select the tool. You can also select it by using the letter L on the keyboard or shift L depending on how your preferences are defined. And I want to start off by talking you through this image because some parts are going to be fairly easy to select and other parts are going to be a little tougher and it's always best to evaluate the project before you actually begin that's my advice anyway so in my estimation the easiest parts to select are going to be where we have a lot of contrast between the balloon in the foreground and the rest of the room in the background and that's because this tool is by its very nature a edge detection facility so it's actually looking for edges inside the document. And an edge by its very nature, of course, is an area of high contrast. And even though it looks like we've got a red balloon on a white background, there's still actually, believe it or not, a lot of red that resides in the background. Nowhere near as much as the balloon, but there still is more red inside this background than there is blue or green. So we're going to have to be a little bit careful when we're making our selection. The area that we've got to pay a lot more attention to though is this area right here where the balloon meets the light and that's because the amount of contrast reduces greatly when you compare it to the side down here for example. We've also got this lettering around this area that's producing some pretty well defined edges themselves so when it comes time to select this area we're going to need to make sure that we have all of this in mind so we can be extra careful. Alright, so that's a good summary of the challenges ahead. At least we now know what's on our plate. And by the way, we also have our regular selection options. Well, I'd class as regular anyway. Up here at the top left side of the options bar. So we can add, subtract or intersect an existing selection outline. We also have the option to feather the selection. And feathering, just in case you're not sure, is when you add a soft drop-off between the selected and unselected pixels. Entering a value for feathering will, by the way, apply to the next selection you create, not the currently active one. Now the options that I really want to talk about are the ones that will really help us gain complete control of the tool. And that's the three options you see right here inside the options bar. Firstly, we have the width value, then the contrast, and then the frequency. And you can go ahead and change those values before starting your selection. But here's something that's often overlooked. You can change all three of these values whilst you've got the magnetic lasso tool active. So you can weave your way around the image using settings that are best for specific areas. And that's a really helpful feature, as you'll find out. So what do these various options actually do? Well, I'm going to briefly explain the purpose of each one and then I'll show you them in action as we go ahead and select the balloon. So the first option, width, is a measurement in pixels and that determines how far the cursor can be from the perceived edge and still pick it up. So the higher the width value, the further you can stray from the edge you're trying to select. Also, the higher the width value, the more possible edges the tool will have to sift through to locate the most prominent one. Therefore, things are going to slow down just a little bit. And you run the risk as well of picking up other edges. Generally, it's best to lower this as the edge detail becomes more complicated and increase it when the edges are more defined. Next, we have the contrast control, which is a direct measurement of how sensitive you want the tool to be. Again, similar to the way width works, the tool's going to be more sensitive when the contrast value is low. Because the idea is, it's going to try and pick up the lower contrasting edges. So if you have an edge that's well defined, you can afford to increase this value, and therefore make the tools less sensitive. Finally, we have the frequency value, which determines how frequently the tool lays down fastening points, as Adobe calls them. 
So the higher the frequency, the more fastening points we're going to create, which has the result of giving you tighter control over complicated edges, but will ultimately make the selection outline a little bit more jagged. The lower the frequency, the fewer fastening points you'll create, which will make the resulting selection appear smoother, but again at the expense of a little bit of accuracy. So let's rev the tool up and see if we can create a credible selection. I'm going to make a start on the right side of the balloon, just where the moulding is, the moulding that separates the ceiling here from the wall. So I'll click just about here and then start tracing downwards like so. And if I stray away from the edge of the balloon, you can see that we start creating points away from the edge. And it kind of looks like the tool's got lost, or it's trying to figure out where to go. So I'll hit the delete key or the backspace key just a few times, just to get myself back on track here. And what I'm going to do is increase the width value. And I can do that on the keyboard while I'm in full flow here by using the bracket keys. So right bracket takes the value up if you look in the options bar and left bracket takes the value down. Well we want the value up so I'll use the right bracket key to increase the value to say something like about 65, fact, let's go for 75 pixels, that should do us good right here. Now if I start dragging I'm going to be allowed to stray a little further from the balloon, or actually a lot further as it turns out, but anyway we can get away with moving the cursor further from the balloon than we could before which is giving us a lot more room for error, especially when we're dealing with a fairly well-defined edge like we are right here. Okay, I'm going to continue on, trying to be as precise as I can. A lot of people think that they can be as fast as they want and still get the same results. Well, I'll tell you something right now, but speed is not always going to win you the race. I'm going to come right down here to the bottom, dragging away, selecting the image as we go until we run out of space, until we hit the bottom of the image here. And one thing that the magnetic lasso tool doesn't do very well is edges. And this document's going to prove it if we moved it around, which I won't do, but if I moved it around right now it would kind of stick to some of the edges and then go back inwards and then stick to some more. Now the way we could get around that is we could lower the width value to one pixel, but that actually doesn't work out all that well. Instead, I'm going to use that keyboard trick I showed you in the first video to turn the tool into the regular lasso tool. So I'll hold down the Alt key or the Option key on the keyboard and then click and drag. And what you can do now that you couldn't do with the magnetic lasso tool is continue selecting outside the visible portion of the image. So as I'm moving the cursor down here out of view, I'm actually tracing along the edge of the image itself. When I'm back in position and ready to go to commence selecting this balloon, I will simply release the Alt key or the Option key, depending on what platform you're working on, and then continue with the magnetic lasso tool as I was before. So things are looking good. I'm going to continue onwards as far as our efforts go here, bearing in mind that we already have a low contrast value, which of course means that we already have things set up for a high degree of sensitivity that's keeping things pretty accurate. And like I said before, as I make my way up to the side here, there's really no need to rush things. It's always best to be classed as slow but accurate, I'd always say. Now, when we get to the top here, we start to hit a few problems in that we start missing a little bit of the edge here. And then by the time we get to the light, which is at the top, we're actually snapping to the H, which is, well, which contains basically more contrast associated with it than the edge of the balloon at this stage. So we don't want that to happen. So I'll go ahead and delete a few of these fastening points to get us back to where things were looking good. Now I'm going to make a couple of changes to the plan. And the first thing I'm going to do is raise the frequency of the points we're creating just to give us a little bit more accuracy. And I can make changes to the frequency value on the fly by using the semicolon and apostrophe keys. Bit of a strange one that, but definitely worth remembering. So I'm going to hit the apostrophe key until I reach a value of 74. And then I'm going to bring the width value back a bit. So I'll use the left bracket key to lower it to, say, about 30. And we'll see how we get on with that kind of value. 
Before I give it another go, I'm going to press the plus key on the keyboard to zoom in to 200%, just so we get a better view of what's going on. And then I'll pan the image to where I want it using the hand tool. And if you want more details on panning and zooming, as well as a host of other essentials associated with this great tool, then I'd urge you to watch the first part of this video tutorial, available at freephotoshop.com as always. In the meantime though, I'd urge you to once again try selecting the top of this balloon, and once again things work out very badly. So what are we going to do about it? Well, here's what I'd suggest. Let's take that width value down even further. After all, the image we're working on is a fairly low resolution version, so 30 pixels is still a long way. I'm going to reduce the width down to 3 pixels. And even though we're already working with a fairly low contrast value, I'm going to lower that as well. And I can lower that, the contrast value that is, by using the keyboard as I have done with the other two options. But this time I've got to use the comma and full stop keys. And you may also know them as the comma and period keys, depending on where in the world you are. Anyhow, I'm going to use the comma key to reduce the contrast setting to 5%. So now we've got a width of 3, a contrast of 5, and a frequency of 74. Now I'm going to delete any wrongly placed points, and then try again. And as always, I'm going to be as accurate as I possibly can with the mouse, and taking as much time as I need to. I also have the ability, remember, to delete a point if I'm still having problems, and then clicking to add a manual one. That's perfectly acceptable in the world of the magnetic lasso tool, but sometimes, if you get the settings right, you don't need to call on manually added points. Alright, that looks good. We're now back into the slightly easier regions of the image to select, so we can bang that width value back to something like 75, where it was before and indeed where it did us so much good work before. I'm also going to increase the contrast back to 10% by using the full stop or period key, and then finally I'll lower the frequency of the fastening points by using the semicolon key until I get back to something around about 57, like so. Now I can continue to move the mouse back around to meet up with the very first fastening point we laid down, it seems like forever ago now. Once I'm there and I get this little O near the cursor, I'll click it to complete the outline and turn it into a regular selection just like so. And believe me, once you've been using the tool for a while and you've got used to how it works, you'll be doing this kind of stuff in your sleep. It all comes down to experience, it really does. Finally, one last thing I want to show you, and that's this button right up here inside the options bar, Refine Edge. This is new to Photoshop CS3 and indeed Photoshop Element 6 and it's basically where once you've created a selection outline you can press on the button like so and then use the controls here to refine things until they look absolutely perfect. Unfortunately the refine edge command inside Elements isn't as powerful as the one in the full version of Photoshop which you're seeing right here but it is still a good way to turn great selections like the one we've just created into excellent selections. And I'm not going to go into too much detail or any detail at all with this particular command, the Refine Edge command, and that's because it really does require a lot of time to go through these controls and explain how they work. I may consider doing a tutorial on Refine Edge at a later date actually, so if you want to see that one let me know. In the meantime, that's about it folks. Me and you together, we have successfully selected this party balloon using nothing more than the good old magnetic lasso tool combined with some amazingly helpful and practical keyboard shortcuts to give us total control over the job in hand. Well thanks as always for joining me here at freephotoshop.com and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.